Hey everyone, welcome to class. Today, we're gonna to be discussing a framework for internationalization. So for our lecture, first I'll give a quick background about myself. Then we're gonna dive into what is internationalization and what are some of the related concepts around this particular topic. From there, we're going to discuss general principles for roadmap. We wanna take a step back from internationalization to think about the other kinds of initiatives that we could be tackling instead. And then we're gonna to wanna to think about how do we actually evaluate various initiatives and how do we want to evaluate internationalization on its own merits? Finally, we can then discuss how to de-risk internationalization initiatives if we do decide that this is something that we want to invest in. And then we'll wrap up the lecture. So let's dive in. Again, I'm Clement. Uh, my mission is to make product management easier for everyone, uh, which is why I founded Product Teacher. Uh, I graduated UC Berkeley in 2014 with a double major in business and biology, uh, and I've moved through lots of different uh, career trajectories. And since then, uh, I have shipped 10 multi-million dollar products, um, and I've written lots on product management uh, as a really big passion. Uh, if you're ever looking for my books, you can always find them on Amazon. Uh, and if you're looking for one-on-one -on -one coaching or any sort of career services, check out Product Teacher. And with that, let's dive into the course content. So what exactly is internationalization? Well, Wikipedia defines it as designing a software application so that can be adapted to various language without engineering changes. So that's actually the really key part of this definition, the without engineering changes. Because if you did actually need to do all of these different engineering changes to adapt it to a given region or a given uh, language, then that would just be called hard coding. That's not actually really internationalization, right? So the thing about internationalization is that's all about scalability. And a related concept is localization. So localization is taking this internationalized software and making it work for some given region or language uh, by translating text and adding locale-specific components. So just real quick, what is a locale-specific component? Uh, it's things like, for example, uh, date orders. So in the United States, we go month, then day, then year. Uh, in other countries, it goes day, then month, then year. Uh, so things like that. So when we think about internationalization versus localization, really the first thing that we're doing is we're going to internationalize uh, to really do that platform level investment to create that robustness. Then we're going to do the one-off work for each region, and that's localization. In other words, you can't really localize unless you've internationalized. Um, if you do, then you're really just building an alternate version of your website that's just been translated for some given region uh, or language. Um, it's not necessarily something that is a platform level investment. So now I've got a good grasp of what is internationalization. But for internationalization, almost every company is gonna run into the question, should we go international? And if we do, when do we do that? Uh, after all, uh, internationalization is one of many ways in which you can quickly grow a company. You can penetrate new markets, you can access totally new user bases. Um, and so it's very much something strategic to consider of whether to be international, uh, and if so, when. But the things that we want to keep in mind is that internationalization is not just the work of you know, being able to handle different languages. If we do actually go international, right, say that we're based in the United States and we're trying to serve um, you know, New Zealand, as an example, there are lots of things that are different between the two countries. So we need to worry about information security. What are policies that we need to keep in mind when we are, you know, um, securing information in transit or at rest? Uh, what sort of infrastructure do we need to make sure that we have in both of these places? Um, how do we want to deal with legal compliance? There are different laws that govern different regions. And so how do we tackle that? Um, and there are also uh, laws and interpretations that apply if you decide to tackle a different language within your body. Uh, of course, you need to also tackle business development and partnerships, right? Uh, just because you happen to have strength in your current native country uh, doesn't mean that that strength very easily translates over uh, into other regions. And so we need to decide, you know, how are we going to partner with others to get a foothold in that new market? We're gonna to need to have marketing support, sales support, relationship management support, right? Because all of these things are critical uh, for us to establish that beach hold. Uh, and even once the product is out there, how are we gonna support the product, right? If people have questions, or concerns, or feedback, how's that gonna work? How are we gonna deploy the product? How are we gonna make sure that customers know how to use it? 
And so all of these things feed into internationalization. It's very much how to phrase it. One of the things that's true is that people assume that internationalization is something that is straightforward uh, because it's, hey, you know, if we can get into another country, then we can easily make lots and lots of millions of dollars. It's a totally new market. To get into. Uh, but what many people fail to grasp is that there are all of these downstream implications that then kick in uh, that we need to consider. And by considering these things as part of internationalization, that way we can make much more reasoned judgments of when or even if we should internationalize at all. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that as we consider internationalization, that we just keep these gotchas in mind. First off, different regions have different market landscapes. Uh, it's not just you know, one big global market. As much as people like to say that, ah, there's globalization, the world is flat now, um, that's not necessarily true. Actually, lots of different markets have all of these very nuanced market dynamics that are different from market to market. So as an example, China, Japan, and Korea, many times they're just bundled into East Asia, uh, but that's not actually true. The way in which consumers use products, the way in which businesses make purchasing decisions in these three countries is very different from one another. And so we need to very much keep that in mind when we consider to you know, jump into another region. Um, and for a lot of us who are based in the United States, right? I think you know, if someone said, oh, well, we're gonna treat the United States and Canada and Australia and you know, Britain all as the same market because they all speak English, we'd find that kind of laughable, right? Because no, uh, our Canadian neighbors up north have very much different market dynamics. They have different population distributions. They have different user behaviors. And it'd be silly for us to think that, you know, all of these different markets can be clubbed into one. Yet when we think about markets that are outside of our own comfort zones, very much we like to club them together. And that's not a good assumption. Um, so we want to make sure that as we consider how we're going to jump into new regions, that we actually consider each region on its own merits and not fall into the trap of pulling them all together into a single undifferentiated market. So there's that. The other thing that we just want to keep in mind is that whatever region we're going to start in for our current product uh, very much influences which region to go after next. Uh, in other words, our internationalization plan is context dependent. It depends on where we started. Uh, so as an example, if we are in you know, the European Union, uh, it's typically a lot easier to go after other EU countries because they have you know, similar legal frameworks. They have similar kinds of user behavior, even though the languages underneath are very different. Um, you know, in terms of uh, kind of these other regions, right? we want to just make sure that we're keeping in mind that um, some of them are going to share more similar attributes to each other. And so things that we can remember is um, you know, there are legal frameworks, uh, there's user behavior, there's languages that are shared. Uh, as an example, uh, say that you're tackling Latin America. Uh, you started originally in, uh, let's say, Peru. It's likely a lot easier for you to tackle, you know, the Chilean market uh, or, uh, you know, tackling the market in Mexico uh, than to suddenly try to jump into the Chinese market just because you know that folks are going to be speaking Spanish, that they have particular kinds of music paper they can expect, uh, that they have particular kinds of technological progress or constraints. Um, and so based on that knowledge, that will very heavily influence our decision on which region we're going to go after next. So now we know what internationalization is. Uh, we know kind of uh, how to define it. And we know some of the gotchas around it. How do we decide whether to invest in it or not? Before we can even get there, we need to first talk about road mapping. Uh, so what are the general road mapping principles? Well, first off, we always want to tackle the highest return on investment work that we can, uh, because at the end of the day, we as product managers, we are building things for our company and our company is beholden to its stakeholders, its, its shareholders, right? where shareholders, they are trying to grow their money as quickly as possible, as aggressively as possible. And so they're always looking for return on investment. Uh, so we similarly need to empower that return on investment. How do we maximize shareholder value? Uh, by building the things that will really move the needle. Um, so there's that. And that's really important to keep in mind because it doesn't just mean, oh, if it's really small and easy to do, then we just do it. No, it has to have high return investment. And it also can't just be, oh, well, it's a massive opportunity. Well, even if it's a massive opportunity, 
if it also is a massive cost and that you know cost versus benefit analysis is not worth it the roi is lower than something smaller you could do you should probably do the smaller thing because that gives you higher roi so there's that the other thing that we need to keep in mind is as we're road mapping wherever we can we want to focus on being able to learn cheaply and quickly because uh, speed is an advantage. The more that we can understand our markets, our users, the competition, the better we can build products that suit their needs and the faster we can step away from the competition and drive unique value. Um, if we are moving really slowly, um, then the risk is that we've actually built something that doesn't matter, something that doesn't work, something that people don't want to use. And that can be a very expensive mistake to make. Uh, so wherever we can, you know, if multiple things have the same ROI, we want to aim for the things that have a uh, faster ability for us to learn. From. So let's talk about that first principle uh, in more detail. What does it mean to tackle the highest ROI initiative first? Well, before we can do that, we need to first identify what are all the different initiatives that exist? Because if we don't have that good survey, uh, these are the different initiatives that we are considering. Um, then it's quite hard to actually sequence a roadmap. Um, people will suddenly come to the table and say, hey, well, what about this thing? It's, oh, well, I didn't assess it. I didn't know that you cared about it. Uh, so we really want to make sure that we've centralized somehow uh, all of the different initiatives that we're potentially interested in considering for a roadmap. If we don't have that centralization, then we can't actually sequence out the work and tackle the things that give us highest return on investment. The second thing that we need to do is we then need to know, okay, for these initiatives, what are the benefits that they give to the company, right? Because uh, if you're tackling some initiative just because someone told you so, uh, that's not valuable. Uh, so we really need to think about, well, what is the actual benefit of us doing this initiative uh, for our users, for the company, et cetera? And then the third part is for each initiative, how much is it going to cost? Um, you know, even though it may sometimes feel tricky uh, asking people about, you know, how much work is this going to be, right? Uh, you don't want to be perceived as the naysayer, or you don't want to be uh, someone who you know sounds pessimistic. The reality is that all businesses are constrained by resources. Um, we only have so much money and time and people on hand. And so we very much need to make hard trade-offs. The only way that we can make these hard trade-offs is by understanding how much each initiative is going to cost us. Um, and so we do need to have a sense of how much is each thing going to cost uh, if we do take that off. And so what we can do then is once we have benefits and costs for all of these different initiatives, we can then calculate return on investment. So return on investment is actually a very simple calculation. It is benefits divided by costs. That's how that works. Um, and it's a ratio. The higher the ratio, the better. Right? So imagine that you could invest a single dollar and you get back $5. Well, then that has an ROI of five. Um, whereas for some other initiative, you have a cost of you know, $2, and it will give you back um, $4 uh, in terms of benefits. Then that's four divided by two, and that is an ROI or return on investment of two. And so because five is greater than two, we want to invest in anything that gives us five. Um, but there's a problem with this particular framework in reality. Uh, and that is benefits are sometimes kind of hard to calculate. Um, they don't always boil down into numbers, um, and they very rarely boil down into just cold, hard dollars or cash. Um, how would you quantify synergy between different products? Uh, how would you quantify brand name? How would you quantify you know, platform stability or development velocity or scalability or robustness? Right? There are a lot of these different intangible things, right? You know, user delight, let's say. How would you quantify any of this into something that looks like a dollar value? And even worse, you have the same problem on the cost side too. Um, what about reputational risks? Uh, if you ship some product and it flops, right? What does that cost you? Um, what about when competitors react to what it is that you're doing? How do you evaluate that cost? Um, what about all the unknowns that you don't know about? You know, how do you evaluate those costs? And so this seems like an almost impossible problem. Then. We need to be able to identify the return investment for all these different initiatives. So that way we can pick the ones that have the highest ROI, but we can't really do that if we can't measure benefits, we can't measure costs exactly, right? So 
Yes, in an ideal world, if we could, you would love to get actual dollar amounts for benefits and then actual dollar amounts for costs, because then everything is apples to apples. We can just use money uh, to represent uh, how much each thing is worth to the company and how much each thing is going to cost the company. But the great thing here is that when we think about what product should we build next, we're just taking it from a list. We're taking it from some sequence. Um, and so that means that we only need to get the order right. In fact, it doesn't really matter what the return on investment is for any set of initiatives, as long as you get their sequence correct. And so that means then that we don't actually need to have the exact numbers. We just need to get to a somewhat reasonable estimate on how big are the benefits and how big are the costs. So uh, some ways in which we can think about approximating benefits and costs, uh, we can use things like t-shirt sizes, um, extra small, small, large, large, extra, uh, extra large, um, or medium, right? Uh, we can think about orders of magnitude, um, you know, one versus 10 versus 100 versus 1,000. Uh, we can use the Fibonacci sequence. So one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, et cetera. Um, we can use powers of two, you know, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, et cetera. These are all great ways to roughly sequence out how big or small is this benefit and how big or small is this cost. And so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to go grab all of our initiatives and we're going to stick them in some table. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be a piece of paper, whatever, whatever it is that you decide on using. You just need to get all of them into one place and just make sure that you've got each of your roadmap items uh, as rows. Then for benefits, the thing that we want to do is we want to try to compare apples to apples. Um, because if everyone's just kind of qualitatively assigning some value to benefits, then you're going to have people who try to game the system. They're going to say, oh, well, because this impacts this particular department, this department is so important to the company, or because this impacts this initiative and this initiative is so important to the company, um, I'm going to give it an extra large weight. And it's, no, that's not fair. You can't do that. Um, we need to think about things from a more um, unbiased third-party perspective. So what really, really helps is to say, here was some initiative that we did in the past. Right, so it shipped. We all know what it did. Right? We all know that it benefited the company in some way, shape, or form. Right, it moved whatever metrics by however much, and it made people like us by however much more, etc. You have some sort of past initiative where you you have all the facts. You know what the benefits were, and you say that benefit equals one, or that benefit equals ten, or it equals medium, or it equals whatever. You just set some sort of standard definition of this initiative that we all know about within the company this thing's benefit is some value. Um, and then that way, you have buy-in from all these different stakeholders who all say, okay, cool, sounds good. We're going to define that thing as having that amount of benefit. The other thing just to keep in mind is that benefits are, don't just accrue to your own product. Uh, do please remember that when you build products, uh, sometimes it can benefit other products. Um, and so just keep that in mind as you're determining you know, how do you want to assign uh, values for benefits. And so again, in your table, you've got these rows of initiatives. And then in that next column, you're going to put in some sort of benefit where you said, we define this past initiative that we shipped as benefit equals one. And so then this thing has a benefit of two because it's about two times as valuable. This thing has a benefit of 0.5 because it's about half as valuable or whatever. You just populate that list. And you're going to do the same thing for costs where ideally, you standardize on some understanding of costs with an initiative that most people know about. Um, it doesn't have to be the same initiative uh, that you use to figure out how much benefits are, uh, but it typically helps um, to have them kind of both be equal to one. Um, so you pick some past initiative as the definition, um, and then you use that to then give a rough sense of what all of the other initiatives cost in your table. Um, don't forget that you do need to account for engineering costs, um, cost of partnerships, cost of enabling customers and how to use it, um, legal compliance time to assess it, and all that other stuff. So then once you've got all the initiatives, you've got the benefits, you've got the costs, then you just divide benefits by costs, and then you get return on investment. And so rather than trying to visualize all of this abstractly, I'm actually going to show you what that looks like on the next slide. So here, I have this made-up roadmap. Right. So this is not real. This is not real data. Um, but let's say that for this company, um, we gathered 
all of these different uh, pieces of input from our stakeholders. And we see, okay, uh, there is a chat integration that we're interested in. Uh, we want to implement blockchain. Uh, we want to leverage technical SEO. Um, we want to clean up our homepage. Uh, we want to refactor our infrastructure, our platform. Um, there are all these things that we want to consider committing to. Okay, well, here's the benefit, here's cost. Um, and we all agree that the benefit of the chat integration is about equivalent to some past initiative that we show. And so those two have kind of equal benefits. And the cost of implementing this chat integration is also kind of roughly the same as some thing that we shipped in the past. Right? So we have benefit equals one, cost equals one. One divided by one is one. And so that's a return on investment of one for chat integration. When they do same, we do the same thing for blockchain. We say, okay, if we implement a blockchain, we would get a benefit of about two times as much as a chat integration, but it probably costs us about eight times as much to go do it. So then two divided by eight is 0.25. Right. And so then we just fill out the rest of the table. We can very quickly see that there are these different returns on investment for the different initiatives. And that is then a much more reasoned way for us to be able to say, ah, we're going to prioritize this thing over that thing. So I have not yet forgotten that we're talking about internationalization, but we really did just need to first set how do we prioritize initiatives in general before we can talk about how do you prioritize internationalization? Because if we try to prioritize internationalization in a vacuum and we don't consider how it compares to other initiatives, then we're doing ourselves a disservice. Um, at the end of the day, internationalization is an initiative that you can take. It is something that you would decide to put on a roadmap or not. And so we need to know, well, what else could be sitting on that roadmap? But the challenge of internationalization is that it has a couple of curveballs in terms of how we want to assess it. So first off, Yes, we can internationalize, but what is the scope of the internationalization? Um, how many regions do we want to go after? Um, what period of time are we looking at? Um, which regions? Again, remember before we said that different regions matter in terms of how expensive it's going to be for you to take on. Um, how different are those regions from us? The more different they are, the more likely they are going to be expensive. The harder they are for us to internationalize successfully. Um, and also, what does the competitive structure look like in those regions, right? Is it something where we can very easily take market share? Is it something where there's already a lot of incumbents and it's going to be hard for us to jump in? We need to keep all of these things in mind because they change the benefit and the cost of the internationalization. And again, if we don't know what the benefits and the costs are, then we can't come up with the ROI. If we can't come up with the ROI, then we don't know where internationalization fits into our priority list. So we want to compare apples to apples. Um, it wouldn't be fair for us to say, okay, we're going to evaluate internationalization on the merits of making it into 200 plus countries all at once. That, that's just not fair. Um, and so let's focus on getting into one new region. Uh, and you know, generally speaking, in terms of getting to another region, it takes typically about a year, if not more, to successfully get a foothold into that country. Uh, the other thing just to keep in mind is there is some amount of fixed costs or critical mass that you need to invest in before you can successfully break into a new country. And so just don't go after multiple regions simultaneously, because the more regions you try to parallelize getting into, the higher the cost is going to be for you. So try to break it down into something that's more manageable. And so from a roadmapping perspective, what we're going to do is we're going to say, this is the easiest next region that we can go after, right? We're going to use that to define our cost basis. And let's look at the costs and benefits of doing this over the course of one year. And so then that way we can then fit this in more cleanly with getting into a roadmap. Because again, if our roadmap is looking to the next 18 months of, of uh, development work, and we're saying, hey, internationalization is going to be you know, a decade-long initiative, it's kind of hard to decide whether you should prioritize it or not. Um, and so again, we want to be apples to apples. So we're going to constrain ourselves to, okay, what does internationalization look like for one year um, in the next easiest region for us to go into? So how do we want to analyze the benefit side of the ROI equation for internationalization? Well, first, we want to look at the total addressable market, the TAM. So as an example, that's going to be the number of applicable users who are going to be in that market times the opportunity that you can reap per user. Again, don't forget the competitive landscape. Um, and you know, how much market share could you actually take in a single year? Then to analyze costs, don't forget the setup costs. It's not just engineering costs. It's not just design costs. We also need to keep in mind the other things that we need to do to successfully spin up in that new country. We need to think about information security. We need to think about 
uh, legal and compliance, uh, marketing and branding. Uh, we need to think about operations, right? What does it mean uh, to have a support line or to have a chat line or to you know help people out when they get stuck or locked out of their accounts or there's a problem that comes up, right? What does all of this stuff look like? We need to incorporate all of that into the costs of breaking to a new region too. So we've assigned some, again, somewhat arbitrary, I guess, value, something where it is, you know, reason, you're looking at something that you've built in the past, um, you, you, you come up with, you know, generally benefits are this much, costs are this much, this is the ROI for internationalization, and now we can look at internationalization's return on investment versus all of our other initiatives, and I can decide, okay, where do we want to slot this? If internationalization is, you know, a top one or top three priority, we're probably going to be tackling it. Um, and if it is not high in ROI, then it's not a priority. And so there's really only one of two outcomes that can come out of our exercise. If it's not a priority, what we want to do is we want to set this initiative aside, but we don't want to just ignore it because it could become a priority in the future. And so what we want to do is we want to put in things called decision triggers, um, which basically let us know when should we reevaluate this situation. Uh, what you don't want to do is you don't want to reevaluate every single day because that is expensive. Um, you could be doing other things with that time. Uh, but you also don't want to just leave it in a box and never look at it again because what if the market shifted? What if you are now able to jump into some new market at relatively low cost or a relatively high benefit, right? And so um, things that are helpful in terms of uh, setting decision triggers, uh, you can assess it every you know, time-based trigger. So let's say every quarter or so or every year or so. Uh, you can look at action-based triggers, right? So say that a competitor is jumping to a new market, that's when you think about, okay, should we do this or not? Um, and so uh, you can use these different ways of saying, these are the rules that I'm going to use to decide whether we should look at internationalization again or not, and use that to decide whether it's ROI is now high enough for us to prioritize. So that's what happens if it's not a priority. If it is a priority, that's when we're going to lean into our second grid mapping principle which is to learn cheaply and quickly. So something to keep in mind is that it's not super safe to just go and build a whole new platform from nothing. Uh, you don't want to just build up the entire internationalization platform right out of the gate because that's kind of expensive. That can be something that takes multiple people, multiple years to get done. Um, you want to be able to reap the benefits quickly. You want to be able to learn quickly. And so how do we do that? Well, there are a couple of ways that we can quickly test demand, and we can also quickly understand what is the benefit of internationalization and what is the cost. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how to use fake door testing and how to use hard coding to identify whether uh, we are on the right track. And just, again, keep in mind, cheap testing is better than full implementation almost all of the time because if we can learn quickly and we can iterate quickly, that is far better than us kind of building in a vacuum and hoping that by the end, the market hasn't shifted so much that it no longer aligns. So we want to try to iterate quickly uh, because learning, uh, that speed to learning is a competitive advantage. So what's a fake door test? Well, a fake door test is where you build the entry point into some new experience like internationalization uh, without building the whole thing, without building the actual um, guts of the functionality. Uh, so for example, you can build a country switcher or a language switcher where you just build the UI for it, but you don't actually build the logic. Uh, you can build a map of available regions, let's say, uh, or you build a homepage for a new region, uh, but you don't build out the other pages. And so then if someone clicks into the fake door, then um, you know that they're interested in this particular uh, functionality that you haven't fully built. Yet. Again, it's a really quick way to see, are people interested in what we have to do here? Because say, for example, that I built in some country switcher um, and the country switcher uh, switches in between uh, English and Japanese, right? If I see that almost every user never touches the switcher, like basically no one ever wants to switch into Japanese, um, that seems to signal that, hey, we may need to reevaluate our hypothesis. Is it that um, people don't know that uh, we can potentially serve a Japanese market? Or is it that there's simply no market fit, or there's no market demand, right? So that's a very quick way for us to know what is the demand in this new region. If they do click in, right, like say that you get a bunch of people trying to switch your website over to Japanese, well, then 
what you want to do is you want to be transparent. You want to let them know that, sorry, we haven't built this thing out yet. We're just testing demand. Um, and be helpful, right? Let them know that, you know, we are considering that we want to uh, build this thing. Uh, would you like to sign up on a mailing list? That way we can let you know when Japanese is available. And so by doing so, you can actually very quickly test demand for a hypothetical internationalization initiative. Um, it can take less than two weeks to do. Like I've done this before where I spin up some fake door test and I can build that out pretty quickly um, and get you know, real results piping through. And the benefit of a fake door test is that's actually in your product. You can actually see people's native behavior um, rather than kind of having it be more of this like user testing thing where you like walk people through wireframes or you do user interviews because then people will tell you stuff that they want you to hear. It's not really native to your product. Um, and so you'll typically get inflated results where people will want to say, oh yeah, of course, I definitely want to use that new feature. Uh, kind of production is the ultimate test, right? And so if we can see that in production, people actually do want to use this feature, that's a pretty good bet that the benefits are actually there for us to invest into. So we now know how to use fake door tests to quickly validate, is there benefit to internationalization? Say that we have a benefit. Well, how much is it going to cost us? Uh, another thing that we can do is we can actually test a hypothesis of how much is it going to cost us to build out internationalization. And so again, the right way to do it is to build out this you know, super robust, super scalable platform that then lets you componentize all of the different languages, displays, um, and information uh, to be country specific or language specific. But that's really expensive. And so what we can do instead is we can hard code it. We can basically use these different you know, if-then statements to say, for the first couple of regions outside of our initial region, uh, we're just going to do this kind of the, um, the duct tape and bubblegum way. Uh, we're going to do this uh, manually. And yes, it means that we're introducing a lot of if-then logic, which is not scalable. Um, but the good thing is that it teaches us the following. It tells us, how expensive is it for us to go build out the actual robust platform? Uh, what are the places where we actually really need to invest in really deep abstraction? So real example, um, I think um, for a product that I was building where we were internationalizing, uh, we did not realize that the way that we displayed dates was actually hard-coded into the database and that the database's uh, kind of default structure um, forcefully converted any sort of inputs that we made into like a United States date format. Um, it wasn't a string that we could easily override. And so for us to figure out how to make that work, we were like, oh crap, like we need to actually abstract this a lot better. Um, and so that's a very valuable learning by hard coding. Like we can very quickly see, ah, so this is something that we're gonna need to watch out for if and when we do decide to invest in this more robust version. And sometimes we can also learn that we can actually get away with hard coding. Like it doesn't need to be super robust. Um, you know, robustness just for robustness's sake is not valuable to the business. If it's something that lets the business move faster, then great, you should invest. Um, but if you have something that is you know, hyper-scalable, um, but costs decades to build, it doesn't help the company. Uh, so we want to know, well, where are the places where we can actually get away with <coughs> a little bit of messiness? And where are the places where we actually absolutely need to invest in something that's a lot more robust and better abstract? So we've now used the fake door test to validate the potential benefit of internationalizing. And we've hard-coded our first one or two regions um, to validate the cost of internationalizing. And now we know that the ROI is actually there. We, we do want to continue to move forward in this trend. Okay, great. To do so, we then need to decide, are we going to be more short-term focused or are we going to be more long-term focused? Right? So are we going to do more hard-coding um, and basically get things out the door quickly and kind of get more of those learnings? Or do we want to formally internationalize where, you know, we're going to take a lot longer to bring up the next couple of regions. But once we have that, it's much easier to add on all of the other regions. I do just want to call out that every time we launch in a new region, there are some things that are just simply inherently non-scalable. Uh, every region has some fixed cost associated with it, and we would do well to keep these things in mind. So just drawing from some other examples. Some of the most famous and successful companies in the world 
could not break into other regions. And so we should not be surprised if our hypothesis falls through because it doesn't always succeed. Uh, so some examples, uh, Uber and Google were unable to successfully break into China. Uh, eBay could not break into Japan. Uh, McDonald's can get into the Caribbean. Uh, Starbucks can get into Australia or Israel. And so again, these are all really gigantic brand names um, who have all of these people who very, very much care about internationalization. They are very successful at doing it, but there are some regions that are just hard to get into um, from that company's perspective. And so we just want to keep in mind that even though we decide to internationalize, we can't do it all in one fell swoop. We want to sequence out the work so that, that we're taking down you know, manageable chunks of work and reaping um, benefits as we go along the way, instead of trying to get the entire world to um, work with our product uh, all in one fell swoop. So just, again, make sure that you break this out into sequences. And so just a quick thing, uh, I know that um, some folks in the audience uh, currently work at localization products and lo localization companies. And so I just do want to call out a couple of things that you can do to help get your customers, your potential clients, to further prioritize uh, localizing um, and to further prioritize internationalization. So again, let's remember that um, product companies are always going to take on the thing that gives them the highest return on investment. And return on investment is calculated as benefits divided by costs. So our options are to either help demonstrate that there are more benefits or that we help to reduce the costs of internationalizing. So as a internationalization company or vendor, um, ways in which I can show my customers or my prospects that there's actually a lot of benefit here is to help demonstrate market demand by doing things like market reports of, hey, you know, there is this particular market that you may not have assessed yet. Here are all the statistics that demonstrate that if you move into this country, you will likely succeed. Um, using that helps to make the uh, return on investment, that business case, a lot clearer for that company and its executives. And you can also help them run fake door tests to validate demand. Again, fake door tests are quite uh, low cost to develop. You know, you can build out an entire uh, homepage, uh, you know, in just a handful of weeks. And you can show that to prospects and say, look, like we built this very quickly. You can use this to validate demand. And if it's something that's valuable, let's help you get all of your other uh web properties or you know mobile properties uh, to also be localized. So there are ways that we can increase potential benefits. Uh, in terms of ways in which we can decrease costs, um, do remember that translating is not the important part. Um, it's actually quite straightforward um, to find someone to translate some string or phrase. Um, the hardest part is the actual internationalization itself. Um, and so we want to help make it less expensive uh, to internationalize by demonstrating engineering thought leadership of how to actually go build out internationalization uh, platform-wide changes, right? So uh, there are some uh, resources um, that we've found um, that can potentially be helpful for you to structure um, into something that uh, helps your customers understand, ah, okay, so this is how we would internationalize if we wanted to. Uh, we'll also want to demonstrate legal and compliance thought leadership um, for things like uh, privacy, like GDPR, um, encryption, um, end user license agreements, information security, all that good stuff. So the more that we can make internationalization uh, something that's easy to grasp and less of like a black box full of scariness, the more likely we can convince uh, product teams to lean in favor of internationalism. We also wanna make sure that we understand that most product companies have a build versus buy mentality, where many times they are very interested in building things themselves, because if they can build it themselves, um, then it is their competency. Uh, they are not reliant on other people, um, and it's something that they get to have full control over. What you want to focus on is less what is the cost of using your company, uh, but rather what opportunity costs is this product team leaving on the table uh, by deciding to go after internationalization rather than something where they could yield bigger benefits. Right? Um, so we want to prove to them, or what you want to position to them, is by working with you, because you are an expert in localization, uh, they no longer need to take on all of this onboarding cost, all of this implementation cost. They can go focus on the things that they are best at and reap more value that way, right? So what you want to demonstrate to them is that by uh, delegating uh, some of that work to you, by you know each independently specializing in something, 
Uh, that way you both uh, get to make faster progress to that. And finally, um, you'll want to try to understand your prospects or your customers and procurement standards. Uh, the more you understand what they're thinking about from an infosec, legal compliance, reliability, disaster recovery, all these sort of things um, from these perspectives, the more that you can help to mitigate these risks, the more that you can proactively address these concerns so that they say, oh, well, okay, well, we now know that there are fewer risks ahead of us. Risks are, again, costs. Um, the fewer risks there are, the more comfortable we feel that we can commit to doing this initiative. And so these are really great ways to help make localization a lot more palatable and a lot more investable uh, for product companies. So to summarize our lecture here, uh, internationalization is one of many potentially valuable initiatives that we can take. Um, and so for us to actually uh, assess it appropriately, we want to look across all of our initiatives. And for all of our initiatives, we want to look at return on investment, which is benefits divided by costs. Just the sequence matters. And so it's okay for us to have kind of uh, squishy numbers. Um, it doesn't need to be exact, exact dollar values because we just want to get the sequence of things correct. Um, if it is, um, you know, if internationalization winds up being one of the highest priorities, then let's figure out how to de-risk it. Uh, run fake door tests to learn about the benefits. Um, and hardcore the first couple of regions to learn about uh, what is it going to take us to actually go with all this. And so that wraps up our class here. Um, thanks so much for attending. Really excited. Uh, I will be uh, releasing this recording uh, in a couple of days. Um, and so with that, uh, looking forward to our next class. Thanks so much. See you soon.